So uh, the field that I work on is called, it's, uh, so what I work on is experimental nanoscience. Uh, a typical view of how things evolve with size is something like this. You start with atoms and molecules, then you have nanostructures and nanotechnology, and then you finally go to a bulk uh, piece of material. This is, from the point of view of somebody like me, this is incomplete, because right here in the middle, you have these things that I study, which we call clusters. Here's a couple of models, which are things where you put together clumps of atoms of molecules such that they're, you know, somewhere on the order of tens, hundreds, maybe thousands or tens of thousands of pieces. They are bigger than a chemist would recognize a molecule. They are smaller than what a nanotech lab would be working with as a piece of technology. But what we are interested in is finding out how you go from this side to that side as we make things grow literally atom by atom or atom by molecule. So I'm not really building devices. I'm making these clusters. I try to understand what their fundamental properties are. And uh, being squeezed, as you can see, between all these areas, we deal with uh, molecular people and atomic people on one side and uh, surface people and uh, nanotech people on the other side. So it's, so it's kind of a fun place to be. Just a few examples. The most famous example of the outgrowth of this field is are these soccer ball shaped molecules called fullerenes or buckyballs that were discovered in a lab very similar to mine about 20 some years ago. Uh, it's interesting to study them as they just fly through in a beam because then they're not subject to any uh, forces that obscure what's going on, or for practical purposes, it's interesting to try to deposit them on surfaces, make new kinds of films, materials, things like this. Again, as I said, this is not fully organized, but to give you an idea of what it's like. So in my lab, we mostly study them isolated, where we can use a mass spectrometer to understand how they really evolve, literally step by step, atom by atom. Uh, we make them by generating a vapor of the material of interest. And that can be done in different ways, either by heating up a low melting point material or by creating a discharge that will vaporize atoms of a harder material. You can make clusters out of anything. Uh, and the idea then is to cool down that vapor, expand it through a small pinhole and make a jet. So it's actually exactly the same principle as uh, underlies the uh, making of artificial snow. So essentially what we make are jets of snow, except our snow is not made up of only water, it's made up of metals or carbon or something like that. And in fact, this kind of stuff is interesting to show. I don't think you can really let a kid play with a cylinder of compressed gas, but you can show how it's very easy to show if you just have a small pinhole and crank up the pressure. Out comes the jet. If it's, for example, uh, CO2 gas, it uh, condenses into dry snow, and you just see a jet of dry snow going out, and you can feel that the nozzle gets really cold right away. I don't know how to implement it, but it's a fun thing to at least uh, demonstrate. One, of some of the things we're interested in is how these individual atoms pack into. Uh, structures and you can end up with certain structures that are especially symmetric and therefore especially stable. One of the things, that, another thing that we study is uh, their optical properties because what happens is with these small particles when the electrons slosh in the metal the color of uh, light that gets absorbed or emitted in fact depends very strongly on the size and uh, so here is a picture from somebody else's lab if you make silver and gold particles of different diameters their colors change dramatically and in fact you can tune the color by changing the size of the particle and by changing the material you embed it into and that happens to be in fact an ancient recipe for stained glass not all stained glass is made like this but much, a lot of stained glass is made by embedding small particles into it. And so there's probably some basis for maybe some demonstrations using, using this. A former postdoc of mine who is now teaching in Oklahoma sent me an article from a chemistry journal where you can somehow synthesize paint that has nanoparticles embedded in it. 
and the paint comes out to be different colors depending on the size and you can uh, use that to smear it on glass and make stained glass so you can somehow solidify it and make sort of gel-like solid gel-like materials of different colors and apparently there is an article in the Journal of Chemical Education on this that I haven't read very carefully but apparently that can be adapted to anywhere from elementary school levels up to college levels. To show this a very famous example of this optics of small particles, this is a Roman cup called the, uh, the Kyrgyz cup. It's in the British Museum. It's about this big. And as you can see in reflected light, it looks green and in transmitted light, it looks red. And that is because that glass has small nanoparticles of silver and gold embedded and it's the optical properties of those particles that gives rise to this amazing effect. Actually about five years ago the Getty Villa had an exhibit on ancient glass and I read in the newspaper that they brought this over there so I dashed and saw it myself so I can certify this is true. So I already showed the carbon fullerenes and they named buckyballs after Buckminster Fuller so probably some kind of designs can be built, ideas can be based on this and they have all kinds of shapes. You can, if you, you can buy fullerenes of different uh, sizes. The smallest ones look like soccer balls, larger ones look like footballs or rugby balls. If you dissolve them in a chemical, they actually give you different colors. You dissolve them in toluene, so it probably is also not the best thing for elementary school kids, but it is something that you can show. They're all, I don't really work in nanotubes, but they're just kind of outgrowths of these fullerene things, and I have the slides, so I threw it in. And then the final thing I work on is small clusters of water molecules. So this is kind of trying to understand, for example, chemistry of water and solvation of elementary things at the very small level, where you just have a small number of water molecules, kind of nanoscale droplets of water, and you're trying to understand what is going on when you throw something in there. And that, of course, at least with water, you don't have to explain to people why it's important. So, uh, so that's convenient. And the last thing I want to show is I browse the web, and there are a whole bunch of resources there for outreach in with nanoscience. So, so they, for example, one of the things that I saw they mentioned is you can buy uh, sand that does not get wetted by water. So you can do a comparative experiment. Sand, regular beach sand, you pour water and it gets all wet, and then this other sand, pour water into it, slosh it around, pour out the water, remains as dry as before. And apparently that has something to do with the nanostructure of the surface of the sand, but I don't really know beyond this. So there are some ideas, but we would need to explore them together because... <laughs>